Welcome to Season 3 of The Lifestyle Chase, and I'm your host, Chris Little. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. To help this podcast grow, please share it on social media, rate five stars, tell your friends, and check out the past 140 episodes and counting. You can follow me on Instagram at Christian Little and at The Lifestyle Chase. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. All right, so welcome to The Lifestyle Chase. Today is episode 186. I am your host, Chris Little, and I am joined, I'm actually honored to be joined by the one and only Dr. Mike T. Nelson. Um, Some backstory is uh, back when I went to the Kansas City Fitness Summit in 2019, I actually got to see you, Dr. Mike, uh, present. I thought it was really cool to actually be able to put like faces to names there and um, just it was a pivotal pivotal moment for me and it's like uh it's a conference that i um reflect on quite often now especially having gone through the pandemic and Mm -hmm. for for any listeners um oftentimes i'll reflect on different things that i've read in articles by dr mike and so it's just this is an episode to look at um some some added context is that like anytime that you're listening to someone that you find is interesting it's a good idea to always like look on podcast platforms and find all the other episodes that they've been on that's something that i've done over the past few years is uh oftentimes when when our friends uh dean guido and jeb stewart johnston have you on their show i always listen to those ones and oh yeah over yeah. the over the last like two days i have listened to probably 10 episodes of the flex diet podcast and like my brain is just full of like dr mike t nelson stuff but having gotten all of that ramble out of the way how was your day going today it's been good yeah i got up and got some work done did a little walk a little meditation uh normally late in the morning i've been playing around with some club bell stuff for some mobility that's been kind of fun um yeah got a couple of newsletters written and then uh had another call before this and then uh, another podcast after this a little bit of lifting another podcast after that and a few client stuff so all good (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I often have people give like their introduction because like my audience might be maybe 60% like fitness enthusiasts. We got a few trainers that listen, but some people might not know who you are. And I kind of want to hear like, how do you authentically introduce yourself to a room? Uh, depends on the room. If I'm on a flight or I'm in an area where it's usually not fitness people. It's someone who just wants you to confirm their bias about whatever. And I don't want to have an hour conversation with someone who's going to do absolutely nothing with the information. I used to tell them I was a sanitation engineer. So I was the trash guy. <laughs> and then lately I tell them I'm a associate professor of neurology. And then usually they just look at me like a two headed space alien and then they're kind of quiet. I'm. Um, but if it's more, it's a probably professional stuff. I teach for the Kerrigan Institute. So I'm an associate professor there, primarily doing more exercise physiology and some nutrition stuff. And then I have the Flex Diet Certification, Physiologic Flexibility Certification, and then work with clients uh, primarily online doing training, nutrition, mobility. And then I also teach for Rocky Mountain University. So I'll be teaching uh, athlete monitoring course for them coming up again in fall and possibly teaching for reflexive performance reset again. Who knows? We'll see what uh, happens after post COVID type stuff. Definitely. I mean, something that just boggles my mind is how you're able to like consume so much information. Like if, if somebody goes to your website, they can see all of your credentials, the certifications that you've taken and like the years and years of schooling. And it's just like, how do you have the capacity to take in that much information? Because I alluded to how I listened to so many of your podcasts. I was like, oh, man. Oh, thank you. Like, I enjoyed them. But, like, it's, like, it's so (laughs) much information. Like, it's, you almost, your your brain just, like, goes numb. So, with your credentials, like, how how have you been able to keep it up? How do you stay sane with it all? I think part of it, it's a weird thing. Like, um, Like, going through the PhD process, like, part of that is just your 
expected to be super updated in all the literature that's you know in your thesis you're doing classes you're doing research i mean that's kind of your full-time gig it wasn't I, I did mine full-time but i had to work at the same time which i don't recommend to anybody i almost freaking died doing that but um and so it's weird because like for to me that's kind of like the point where i felt like i was actually updated on some stuff so since then, I think the biggest thing that's helped me is what sources are you going to read? What sources are you going to listen to? Again, there's no right or wrong. Um, for me, I like reading the actual primary research. Uh, I do listen to some podcasts, but even then, the podcast stuff is just to try to figure out where did they get kind of their sources from or just for entertainment. Um, and then also being selective about what I don't listen to or consume. Like I don't... <laughs> listen to any news. I actually have email programs that'll pull my email off of Yahoo so that I don't even have to go to Yahoo to log in to even look at a page of that kind of stuff. I tend to generally limit social media uh, things or if I do, it's it's pretty highly um, curated. And then even within, you know, reading primary research on PubMed, um, I have to kind of actively decide what areas am I going to be updated on and what areas I'm just probably going to let it slide for a while. Um, so stuff on metabolic flexibility, I've probably read, you know, everything that's been put out on that just because that's one of my main areas. Um, but even like heart rate variability, yeah, most of the things related to sports performance, but even that, because there's just so much literature, it's almost impossible to stay completely up to date on that. And even things cursorily related, like, you know, protein synthetic response, protein, how it affects muscles, that kind of stuff. Yeah, probably 95% current on it, but probably not up to date current. And that was just more or less because of, you know, time involved. And then there's other areas that I'm interested in that I'll spend more time kind of reading in that area. So I think a lot of it is just having time to dedicate what material are you going to read. And then if I want new ideas, like I love uh, mass that all those guys uh, put out. Um, really good way for me to look at, oh, wow, I didn't even see that this, you know, topic on fat loss or this other thing um, came out. So that's kind of a, a nice kind of all around read too. So just being kind of picky about what you spend your, your time reading. And then the last thing too, is I've actually dedicated more time to reading books that are not directly physiology related, um, which I'd say it has a pro and a con because I always, uh, there's some parts of it, like I was reading one the other day, uh, a great book is a book called Driven. And I really liked it. Uh, a client gave it to me. It's, it's been really good. But then there's like little lines in it that you just bug me. Uh, he was talking about, you know, oh, sugar is addictive as cocaine. And there's like no reference, nothing made to it. It was just kind of this kind of throwaway paragraph. So I have to kind of let some of those lines go away and not give me a whole distaste for the book because it wasn't a nutrition book. That wasn't the whole point of it anyway. Um, so I, you know, I'm very picky with other books I read because if that happens too much, then it just annoys me so bad. I can't finish it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that makes sense. That probably comes up quite often. Like for myself, like I'm not nearly as educated as you, so I wouldn't notice these things as often, but I could totally see how like it can make it hard to enjoy just general things like you just kind of have to uh, be so refined in what knowledge you're seeking out because you have to get through a certain volume of things in a certain period of time like it's just I, I can't even imagine but I have the most respect for the the quest and it just leads me to wonder how did it all begin like um what were you doing at age 20? Like, uh, what was life like before you really dove down the the rabbit hole of like fitness, nutrition, HRV, all that stuff? Yeah, I mean, probably like most guys, I would say I started college when I just turned 18. I went to college a year early I'm on a post-secondary program just because I, I freaking hated high school. And they said, hey, you can get out a year early and the state of Minnesota will pay for a private education for one year. I'm like, great, I'm done. I'm out. Um, so I actually went my senior year of high school, uh, which I just turned 18 when I started college. And like most college people, I was, you know, I'm six foot three and weighed 156 pounds. So I was a very much an eel shaped rake of a person. And I wasn't one of those dudes who's just like really skinny, but like low body fat and just kind of ripped already, but they just don't have a lot of muscle. Like that wasn't me at all. Like I still had a 
paradoxically a fair amount, <laughs> a fair amount of fat at the same time. So I'm like, hey, I'll start lifting. So go to college. They took uh, PE requirements. So quarter one, I'm like, oh, great. There's a class on strength training. I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. They're going to teach us stuff. And the guy walks in who was one of the coaches there. I can't remember what sport he was coaching. And he's looking around the room and he's like, all right. Wow. Some of you need to lose weight. He's looking around and he's like, and he points at me and he goes, holy shit. Some of you need to gain weight. <laughs> I was like, great. This is your intro speech. Wonderful. And then he disappeared and the, the TA just took attendance. I'm like, you didn't teach us anything. Like he's like, oh, just go lift stuff in the gym. You know, it's like most people you know, do everything wrong for decades, you know, get injured. Uh, but at the same time, I was super interested in the, the process. So I did a Bachelor of Arts in Natural Science. And this is at St. Scholastica in Duluth, Minnesota. So private uh, Catholic college. And they actually had anatomy and physiology that you had cadavers. That they got new cadavers every quarter. And so for an undergrad anatomy and physiology class, that's like exceedingly uh, rare. Uh, so I got the opportunity to, I just took anatomy and physiology for fun, basically, and take it with, you know, actual cadavers, which to me was like fascinating. You, <clears throat> you get to look and see, they're all prosected, but, you know, to see what was going on. And I just started taking more physiology classes because I'm like, well, the, the more I learn, the more I'll be able to figure out and how to apply it. And then uh, graduated from there, did a minor in chemistry, went to uh, Michigan Tech in the upper peninsula of Michigan, and did a uh, master's in mechanical engineering, biomechanics, and do two years of undergrad just before I could get into the program. And even there, I took an exercise physiology. They had a new department. They had a new professor who started my second or third year there. It was my third year there. And he was teaching exercise phys, which is the first time the college uh, had that. And so I went to him and I said, hey, can I just take your class? I'm like maxed out on, on credits. Um, so I, I can't really take any more credits. Can you just, you know, can I just take the class, you know, for free? Because I've already paying the full load anyway. And he's like, well, technically I can't assign you any more credits because you're at the max and you can't go over that. I'm like, what if I just show up at your class like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at like 10 a.m.? He's like, you want to show up in a class that you get no credits for, that's a 400 level class. I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, have you taken exercise phys before? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, what do you want to do in a 400 level class? I'm like, cause it's so cool. <laughs> and he's like, all right, if you just happen to show up at that time period, I'm not gonna kick you out. You're not gonna get credit or anything like that. I'm like, oh, that's fine. I don't care. I had enough credits. So yeah, I just found like the more you know, stuff I could take in that area was just for me, like super fascinating. Where do you think that like started? Like, have you just always been like, have you always craved to know more about things? Has this been something you've done since you were a kid or like, uh, what, what's, what's the backstory there? I think part of it is if I think back, it's funny how like things happen to you. And at the time you don't really sort of connect the dots. Right. So when I was, Four and a half years old, I had open heart surgery for an atrial septal defect. All right, so for listeners, and you obviously know this, like your heart's got four chambers. The top two are the atrium. And then the one side has oxygenated blood. The other side has deoxygenated blood. And when you're uh, in the womb, there's a hole between the atrium and the bottom, the ventricular. And that allows the blood to just go in a circle, right? Because if you're in the womb, you're not breathing. There's no air coming in. And then when you're born, those holes actually close up. Now you're breathing air, so you have the oxygenated and the deoxygenated blood don't really mix with each other. In my case, I had the ASD, the atrial hole, and the ventricular hole stayed for quite a while. Uh, the ventricular, or it's called the VSD, did close on its own, uh, but the atrial one never did. So when I was four, um, the pictures of x-rays, my heart was the size of someone who was 18. So I basically had uh, heart failure. So your heart's working so hard because it's just so inefficient. It actually, because of the stress, gets a little bit bigger and it becomes sort of a pathology. And so I had open heart surgery when I was four and a half. They go in, they do a thoracotomy. So they crack your chest open with a bone saw, cut through your ribs, cut through the atrium, and they just stitched it shut. Uh, luckily, they didn't have to use an occlusion device or anything like that. So I was in the hospital for probably like 10 days total. Um, 
it was crazy waking up being, you know, having my arms and everything tied down because there's so many IVs and was on a ventilator for a period of time and stuff. And then fast forward from there, like a half a year later, I remember going into the eye doctor and I started seeing in uh, double vision. And so they're asking me, the eye doctors, like my parents told me the story. They said, there's this little dog at the end. And they're like, you know, how many of the dogs do you see? I guess I told my parents like, well, I see two, but only one of them's real. <laughs> because when you, you see in double vision and then you interact with your environment, you learn right away what's the real image and what's the false image. So what happened with that is I had a, a lazy eye. So my eyes didn't work together and my eyes were kind of offset a little bit. So the two images go to the back of your brain and when they're offset, your brain normally, just because of your eye position, they're skewed on your face a little bit. It has the two images and it can fuse them together and your brain creates this three-dimensional image because your eye position, they're off a little bit. Uh, my eye position was off a lot. So instead of being able to fuse the images, they're so disparate that it saw two of everything. Um, but what they did at that point is they said, oh, you have, you know, strabismus, lazy eye. We'll just put a patch over your, quote, good eye, and we'll make your, your bad eye work more. And so they did that for a period of, I don't know how many months, quite a while. And then after that, my eyes would track normal, and they go, oh, you're great. Don't worry about it. And so all this, I didn't really figure out until I was probably in my late 20s. Um, so back to what you do as a kid if you have uh, severe heart failure and you can't see in 3D, you don't do a lot of shit. <laughs> That's what you do. Like you sit around a lot. Cause I remember running up the hill in my backyard and just being incredibly winded. I couldn't figure out why I'm like, this doesn't happen to anybody else. Like what, this is weird. And then if you, your brains work around to prevent seeing and double vision all the time is to do what's called a visual suppression. So in my case, the two images that come to the back of the brain and your brain goes, Ooh, we don't like seeing double vision. That's really bad for our survival. So let's just drop one of the images. So if we drop or we suppress one of the images, then aha, no more double vision. So you went from binocular to monocular vision. So I can even now, it's a lot better than what it was, but even back then, if you covered one eye, I could see fine. If you covered the other eye, I could switch eyes back and forth, but I could not fuse two images together. So if you imagine trying to play ball sports, I hated ball sports all through high school and at the time, I just thought, eh, some kids are bad at ball sports. Did they just get hit in the face with balls? That's just what happens to them. That's just kind of my life in, you know, whatever. I didn't really think a lot about it. And then you realize that, oh, yeah, like the worst was like baseball or softball with like a pop fly, right? Because you'd be in the outfield and you're looking up, which for most people is pretty easy, right? You've got plenty of time. Your brain can figure out where the object is. For my brain, it was horrible because every single workaround that I used, right, looking at light refraction, parallax, how you move through your environment, all this stuff goes away. All I'm staring at is a ball that I can see coming, but I don't know where it's at. And so more often than not, it would hit me square in the face, <laughs> which, you know, you know, none of the kids understand that. You're like, you just missed the easiest you know, thing. What's wrong with you? Um, so I did a lot of reading. Right, because when you read, you don't need 3D vision. And if you're not very good at moving around, eh, sitting in one place, doing a lot of reading is good. It's probably a good thing they didn't really have a lot of video games back then or my parents didn't let me have them. Um, so even as a young kid, I just did, I think as a escape a lot of reading. And then you get kind of, you know, sort of rewarded for, you know, doing those things and doing your homework and all those tasks you could do that don't require 3D vision. You probably tend to be uh, more skewed into that direction then. That makes sense. And it's uh, cool to get that side of you because it's just like it, it explains so much how you would have like the, the boundaries in check to be able to go back to reading so regularly and just why some things would be more deeply meaningful to you. Cause something that I think about often is just like, it's, it's one thing to see a person just when everything is going well, but when one thing goes wrong, like how do they keep up these things? But it kind of sounds like um, the the reading and the pursuing knowledge and like honing your craft and, and researching and all these different things, those were the things that that was like your sanctuary. And that's not the case for a lot of people. Um, 
when it came to like all the schooling you did in like the first five years, like maybe from age 18 onward, like what was the the toughest moment for you? Like what, what challenged or tested you the most where you thought maybe, maybe this wasn't going to work or, or were you fairly steadfast and just stayed the course kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I think everyone has challenges. Um, I mean, for me, I did seven and a half years full time, like nonstop. Uh, so did my undergrad, changed degrees, did a master's. And then when I got done with that, I'm like, I'm never going back to school again. Haha, uh -huh. that lasted a couple of years. Um, but during that time, anatomy and physiology was the only class I didn't really have to study that much for. And I don't know if it's uh, the professor was uh, Dr. Shizaldo, super cool guy. It was always interesting that he talked very much in visual pictures, you know, because he'd be up there and he'd be like, all right, can you picture this? We've got this system doing this and that system doing that. And I could just sit and lecture and it made sense to me. Like it, for whatever reason, my brain like made sense out of that. And it was also super interesting because it was a small, you know, private Catholic college is back in the early nineties. And we're like, why does that guy have this scraggly long, like red hair, big handlebar mustache, but he's wearing long sleeves on like the hottest days of the year. And we realized later he was covered in tattoos and was this big Harley biker dude. But that was probably kind of frowned upon at the, <laughs> at the college at that time. Um, so that was the only class I could actually just sit and go, oh, this made sense. And so he was super cool because he would give us objectives and say, okay, uh, test exam one is on the first 75 objectives. So it'd be like, you know, name the chambers of the heart, you know, blood flow, blah, blah, blah. Because he's like, I don't want to reward students who guess better what the professor thinks is important and study that more and do well on the test. He's like, here's the things I want you to know. Here's the things you'll be tested on. Make sure you know these and you'll do fine. So everyone was always like super freaked out about, you know, doing the objectives, you know, like many days before and I would sit down and just like look them over the night before and do fine on the test. Um, unfortunately, that was the only class that ever that ever, <laughs> ever really happened to me. Um, math was probably by far the hardest. Uh, obviously, if you go into engineering, I didn't, idiot me at the time, didn't realize how much math that actually requires. It's like, oh yeah, for your undergrad, you almost end up with a, a minor in mathematics. You take, you know, um, linear algebra, then you take calc one, calc two, calc three, calc four, differential equations. And like Calc 2, I had to go over to the University of Minnesota Duluth just because of a scheduling thing. Mm -hmm. And that was like super hard because it was a bigger college. It was a lot of people in class. It was harder to get the, the TA's time. And so I remember like the whole time doing my undergrad, even through my graduate work, I would uh, try to find like the smartest kid in class who was, I would look for the kid who was the smartest in math, who was also very bad at getting anything done. And so I'd go up to him and be like, hey, buddy, I'll make you a deal. I will come over to your place and force you to do your homework so that you get stuff done. And then if you just help me work through the problems and usually they're like, okay, sounds good. Um, and I, I had multiple other friends who were a couple of grades above me that I literally just, you know, begged my way for them to help me through calculus and math and stuff. And when I got to engineering, oh, man, like, I mean, I can honestly say that my, master's in mechanical engineering from a difficulty of the actual material itself was way harder than anything I did in my PhD from a just difficulty of the subject matter because it's all math and physics based, you know, and I eventually graduated. I did okay. Um, I would say the PhD was much more difficult from a, a pure ganadal fortitude of just finishing the thing. Cause it took me friggin' seven years full time to finish. Um, but I didn't think the material probably because I was more interested in it also, and it just was a better fit for me. Uh, it was actually easier than what I did for my master's. That makes sense. Um, something that you kind of alluded to earlier in our episode today was just the fact that you kind of like burnt the the candle at both ends in uh, getting your, your education. Just like you were saying you were working at the same time of pursuing education. You wouldn't recommend that on anybody, but having heard that every like there's a lot of people it's kind of like exercise like anybody within the fitness space we're kind of crazy so chances oh, yeah. are like somebody's going to listen to this and they're going to be that person that does it like i know i've kind of like run myself into a wall a few times um how 
what what were the deepest depths of that journey and like how how did you get to the other side kind of thing yeah so what happened was so i finished my undergrad finished my master's started working for a medical tech company in cardiovascular implantable devices you know go figure right so i have open heart surgery i end up working for a cardiac medical device company i worked there for 10 years uh, implantable pacemakers defibrillators and it was super interesting i really liked it but i also realized at that time who being in a corporate environment, not so good. And I'm like, oh, I want to go back to school. So I did five years in a PhD program in biomedical engineering. Yeah, that didn't go so well um, just because it was more math. And I realized that funding was very hard. Trying to get funding in biomedical research when I was working for a biomedical company that was not the main funding company at the university. There was just way too many legal conflicting things. And so that's when I dropped out and went over to uh, exercise physiology. When I started exercise physiology, they're like, ah, you know, it's going to suck, but yeah, four to five-ish years, you know, you'll, you'll be done. And so I'm going, okay, I can drop down to part-time. So the job I was at, I went back to my old boss there and said, hey, I'm going to go back to school. I know you need another person in this department. I did this job before. Um, the caveat is I only want to work part-time. And they're like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, great. Well, I'm not going to come back and you're going to be two people short then for however long. And then they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> um, and so they said, okay, come back, work 32 hours a week to your on call, and then we'll drop you down to 24 hours a week. It's like, great. So I did that, started going back to school, started taking classes. You know, the first like three years, it eh, wasn't too bad. It was busy, but it was just more of a, a scheduling issue and trying to schedule a call and everything else. Um, but then it looked like I was going to finish. So I'm like, okay, so now I'm going to start ramping up my fitness business more, which I was still doing on the side. And then I hired a business coach. And unfortunately, my PhD then took me way longer than I thought. So it was the last probably three years of my PhD that was the worst by far. Because um, during that time, I met my wife. So we ended up getting married. And I was working 24 hours a week at the med tech company. I was on call full time for them. And I was still running my own fitness business. And then I was in the process of doing research. So I would go down to the University of Minnesota. I would start, you know, a lot of times when I was running my own studies at five in the morning. So you had to turn on all the machines. First person comes in to be tested between 5.30 and 6. Do that. Go to class. Do research. Go back to work. Come back down to the University of Minnesota. And whenever I had like, a, I had a 20 minute break before the labs I was doing at that time. So I would go out in my car, I had a Volkswagen Jetta and I had a pillow that I left in the back and I would at nine in the morning and I started taking caffeine power naps. So you take like half a no dose or one no dose and then you sleep in your car for 20 minutes and then you wake up and you have higher levels of caffeine. You had a little bit of a nap. So I did a lot of that, which I would not recommend for uh, daily use. <laughs> um, and it was it was pretty bad. So at the end, my whole goal was, I realized if I wasn't a teaching assistant, so I did my four and a half years of that, that that freed up a lot of time, but then that meant that I had to pay for education, you know, some other way. And then at the end was just, I just want to finish. And I remember having blood work done like three years before I finished. And like testosterone was like 220. Like all my blood markers were just atrocious. Uh, luckily, my cholesterol uh, triglycerides weren't too bad. And so I did that every six months because I was like, mm, I don't want to do anything that I'm going to permanently damage myself, but I'm, I'm okay to, you know, kind of push the envelope. Um, because previous to that, you kind of, and everyone kind of, you know, this is Joseph Campbell stuff, right? Everybody kind of reaches a point where, okay, I'm not going to do this or I'm just going to finish. And I remember sitting down, uh, crying, talking to my wife. And I said, this is something that I want to finish. I don't care if anyone ever gives a rat's ass. I don't even care if I get employment from it. I just felt that if I looked forward into the future, I invested four years by that point already, that if I didn't finish that, I felt like I would regret it for no other reason other than it was something that I just wanted to do. And I said, even if that means I may have to transfer to another university, if this doesn't work out, I may have to fly back and forth on weekends, whatever. Um, and so I think it was kind of that threshold moment where you're like, okay, it's like the, the old saying, right? So 
was it uh, was it Cortez who got to the the U.S. or some other island, and they said, okay, our only way is we're going to conquer all these people, and he just burned all the ships, right? He's like, the only way forward is that's the only way we're going. Um, so I think that was helpful. Um, and then just, you know, doing whatever you can just to manage each particular day. Uh, finished it, got done. And then I slept for 11 to 12 hours a night for literally like four months. And I was still just destroyed. And long story short, I ended up paying a good buddy of mine, Dr. Michael Ruscio. Flew out to his place, California, did a bunch of blood work. And it honestly, it took me probably like three years to get back to where I was afterwards. You know, I was basically just like an athlete. I was just had overtraining syndrome, like just from burning myself out. Um, so I don't, I don't regret it. I think, in, and I don't even know if there's anything I would have done differently at the time. Um, if I would have known it would have taken that long, I definitely wouldn't have started doing more business stuff. I would have found other ways to cut back on stuff. But the hardest part about the whole process was, and for people listening, it's harder to deal with stress when you have the unknown. So up until four months before I graduated, I had no idea when I was going to graduate. And I didn't even know if I was going to graduate. So all my studies kept imploding. I didn't get along with my advisor. It was just a freaking disaster. So to have that kind of unknown thing kind of hanging over your head, for me, that was like the most stress. And the only thing that really got me through was that, okay, if it doesn't even work out at this university, then I'm going to go somewhere else and spend another four years and start over again. So I think having those firm decisions of this is what I'm going to do, I'll figure out a way to do it, I think is is helpful. I think without that, you have the added stress of, oh, should I do this? Should I quit? I'm not really sure. And I think now you've just added another unknown and your stress just gets exponential at that point. Definitely. I mean, coming out of this pandemic, I mean, it's still kind of like here, but it's just yeah. we're in a phase where people are able to see each other more and there's a few more certainties. But like during all of the uncertainties, there would be a lot of people facing some comparable stress in, in some situations. Like I Definitely. know for myself, just like not knowing exact timelines as to when the gym was going to open again and just trying to run a business out of it and everything like that. But oh, yeah. Uh, you you mentioned the the business coach and that was something that you talked about in your podcast and so i kind of wanted to talk about it here because usually i hear business coach and i like my the hair stands up on my back because i'm like totally. i it takes everything <laughs> to trust um somebody that calls himself a business coach but something tells me that you found someone that was very positively impactful to you and they brought a lot of value to you so can you kind of expand on your experience a bit more yeah so I mean, I got into fitness more just from a overly educated side. I mean, I I never took an accounting class. I never took one single business class in 18 years of college, like ever. It just, it was never part of any curriculum that I did. So I knew pff, like nothing at all. Um, so the first business events I ever went to was a shout out to uh, Ryan Lee. I uh, went to a couple of his events and God, it was probably 2005, I think. I remember coming back on the airplane and it, it, it sounds kind of arrogant, but have you ever done something and you look around and you, you get in a room with people who are doing the thing you want to do and you realize, yeah, they're not that much different than I am. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I realize I'm like, Oh, they somehow made a business and fitness work. I should be able to figure this thing out. You know? So I kind of failed forward for many years and started training in local gyms and stuff. And it was at that point, it was at one of Ryan's events later on uh, that I met a business coach and he said he was taking some applications. So I'm like, okay, great. Uh, he was a guy, no one really knows him. His name is Christopher Guerrero. Um, but he's kind of one of these unknown people in the industry. He had a bunch of gym chains on the East Coast many years ago, a very successful online uh, business. And a lot of business coaches make me nervous because it's like, okay, well, what what have you done as a business. And a lot of times they haven't done anything as a business. Oh, you live in your mom's basement still. Oh, great. You know, but he had legitimately done it. I talked to him and he actually scared me a lot. He's like, Oh, why didn't you do this? You should have done this or that. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know. I have no idea why, you know, but very from a hardcore business standpoint of, 
you know, you should do this because it'll increase your revenue. And I'm like, oh, revenue, that sounds bad. Like you can make money from this. I don't know about that, you know, but I'm like, why would I hire a coach who would just agree with everything I would say? Like, that's not useful, right? Um, so I hired him. I remember the initial down payment, it was uh, $2,500 a month, which I almost pissed myself to sleep for like the first four months because I didn't really have that amount of money. I had set some money aside, um, but it was good. It was actually super useful um, because he helped a lot of the business processing. He helped set up the website. How do you create a website? How do you hire contractors to do it? So half of that money went to, he was actually doing stuff for my business. The other half went to pay his consulting fee. And so we had like an hour, you know, conversation on the phone every other week. You had deliverable items that you had to, you know, show up. So when I had like just running around with my hair on fire, I'm like, I'm not missing the things that are due because I'm paying this guy a shitload of money, you know, to do it. So it was helpful for me at that time to force me to keep kind of going and simple stuff like just communication style, you know, like how do you write in a way that is true to who you are, but is a benefit to the person reading, you know, because a lot of the stuff I was used to writing was like highly technical. I mean, nobody thinks about writing a, a research study. They don't really think about the reader. It's just like, how do I communicate in this dry sort of formulatic way? That's just the way it's been done since the dawn of time, you know, so trying to flip that around a little bit. And it turns out it was super helpful. So I worked with him for like three and a half years. I did another uh, high-end mastermind after that, which was one of the original uh, barbell uh, masterminds from the guys who did Barbell Shrugged. And it was a huge investment of money and time and stress and like the worst possible time to do any of it. And, you know, when I was done, there was a stretch where I kind of got, you know, 30, 40 grand in debt for a period of time, but was able to get out of it. Um, but overall, I would say it was, it was useful. And even just the mastermind I did after that, like I literally was in California a couple of days ago to help with a project. And the two people who got me into it were at one of the masterminds five years ago. You know, so I think there's something, if you can find like a group of very like-minded people and in that mastermind, they did a really good job of finding very similar minded people. I think it can be helpful. Uh, hiring a legitimate business coach, I think can be super helpful. I don't really know who really passes off as a business coach anymore. Um, but to me, when I set up, I have a flex diet uh, mentorship where we do some business stuff, we do program design, everything else. The main thing I try to teach people is like, yeah, if you're just starting out, just get better at writing content and do it with like the, the goal of the, the reader's perspective um, in mind. And then if you can, you know, kind of, I hate the word network, but if you can find other people that are similar to where you're at, or even just a little bit above you and put yourself in those very uncomfortable positions, I think that's super useful. Like I remember one of the mastermind meetings, I won't say his name, guy comes in, super nice dude. I had known him, you know, sort of from the fitness world and we had a hot seat and he goes, okay, what's your problem? And he goes, you know what my problem is? I have an extra million dollars in revenue this year that I want to donate. I don't know where to donate it. I'm sitting there and I'm like, what? And he was like a legitimate question. Like he legitimately wanted to know like for that money, what was the best place to, to leverage it? I'm sitting there going, wow, okay, that's cool. But to see like actual examples of people who were successful doing it in a good way, not kind of the slimy stuff you see all the time, for me, that was super useful because I'm like, oh, you can do this in like a legitimate way and help people and still keep your values and everything else. Uh, that was super useful. Definitely. I mean, just you kind of outlined some important aspects like they're the areas of, of the title business coach that make me the most nervous is it's oftentimes people that tried something for two, three years didn't work and then they just come up with a new title and that's what they're selling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And yep. like you, you outlined some things that were, were pretty important, just like when it comes with the price tag, but they're actually doing stuff for you. Like that is, that is key. Like if they're actually, um, setting up your website, setting you up with contractors, actually like helping you facilitate like change in your business, that that's pretty cool because like 
the areas where I try to uh, just stay away from myself, but also keep other people away from is when somebody's taken this big amount of money from you and just telling you to charge more. And that's yeah. it. Like that, that's yeah. the worst. Um, and then they don't even tell you what the process is to do that. Yeah. Right? It's like, yeah, I, I, I get that most fitness people should charge more, but wrapped up in that whole entire thing is that they're literally only going to charge what they think it is worth. Right. So just telling someone to charge more doesn't solve any of their issues. So I, I, I agree with you. It's a well-meaning point and it's probably true, but it's also not very helpful. <laughs> and it can be, it can be dangerous. Like it could take someone's oh, yeah. career that could have a positive tra trajectory and just completely like destroy it. But some things that stand out about you that you kind of alluded to, just like you, you kind of cautiously said networking. But the cool thing is when you listen to your podcast, like when you're introducing your guests, it's always like, this is my good buddy. This is my good buddy. Yeah. And I really like that because <laughs> it's um, you can just hear it in, in the conversation. And it also just kind of aligns with like putting out content. Like I find that... Uh, I, I really enjoyed hearing those conversations and then it gave me an idea who I could learn from to kind of like, let's say I had a special interest in something and one of your buddies talked about it, then I could like learn where, where is their actual information, not just the, the conversational information. And then I could dive down those respective rabbit holes. Um, but it's just like, how, how do you network authentically in the industry like i know what my answer would be but i wonder what's yours kind of thing like how, how do you make friends within within the workspace in a way that makes you better similar to how you take in content yeah i'd love to hear your answer after i get mine too um it's just as simple as and this was easier before than it has been the last year and a half like and, and dean's talked about this too just pay money and show up you know, like the first time I met uh, Dean was at the fitness summit and this kind of guy with crazy hair with like all these harebrained ideas looking like an ADD squirrel on meth. <laughs> and he just starts asking me all these questions. And then we ended up doing RPR on him and all sorts of crazy shit, you know, and now he's like a good buddy, you know, it was him and Anthony at the time. Um, so it's just, and he paid a lot of money and just decided to take a year and just go to different conferences because if you go like to, you know, the fitness summit, which I love, that's probably one of my favorite conferences of all time. Most of the people at most conferences are just there for the right reasons. And you already have something that's already in common, you know, and I just can think of just how many different events that I've met people. The first time I ever met Mark Fisher was at the fitness summit, God, probably the first time I went there. We're like drinking beer in some dude's room at like two in the morning. And I was like, oh, hey, who are you? He's like, oh, I'm Mark Fisher. I'm like, oh, great. Well, I'm like, what do you do, Mark? He's like, I run a clubhouse for ninjas in New York City. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And so he, you know, tells me his ideas and stuff. And then my first thought was, who is this guy? This is the worst idea I've ever heard of in my life. And then we ended up having like a two hour conversation about like some Russian block periodization method. And I'm like, holy shit, like this guy really knows like his shit. Like he really knows stuff, you know? Um, Cause I also realized my first impressions are usually horribly wrong about people too. Um, but I'd say just pay, go to conferences, like hang out at the bar afterwards. You don't have to drink or, you know, whatever. Like most of the more interesting conversations are also kind of in between. Um, and, you know, most people are gonna be a little weird, a little socially, awkward in general so if you kind of feel that way great you're at home like i i remember the first legitimate event i went to was um god what was it 2011 2010 uh team Ag, my buddy phil at the time uh put together a little a conference that they sort of uh, organized that was 2005 because i had busted my ankle at that time um so anyway I fly all the way out there. Uh, Dave Tate was doing a guest lecture the Friday night. So I said, oh, I got to go see this. Uh, I ended up getting there late. I ended up riding up the elevator with Dave Tate. And it took like everything I could possibly muster to be like, hi. And he just said, oh, hi, how are you? Like, he was super nice. But I just like, oh, he's not going to like me. I don't know. Um, but I remember the next day at the conference, like, like halfway through, like throwing up in the bathroom because I was just, 
so nervous about just being around people. I don't know what to ask him or what to do, um, but it gets better over time. And then you realize that, yeah, most people are kind of, you know, nervous there too. And just ask questions, just talk to people. Um, same conference. I remember asking TC at a uh, team egg. Cause I was like, I always grew up in the early, you know, 2000s, late 1999 reading, you know, all the articles on there. And I asked him, I said, Hey, TC, I said, I, I know everybody asked you this question, but I said, I, I just have to ask you also. I said, what do I need to do to, to write for T Nation? And he looks at me and he goes, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about getting into fitness a little more. I just started training some people. I, you know, I'm doing a PhD right now in biomedical engineering. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, huh, why don't you go away, come back in about five years after you've done something, and then we'll consider it. And I'm like, oh, and like the time I'm just like completely horrified. going, Oh, the mean man, how dare he say that? And then I realized later, I'm like, oh, like that's actually like legitimate like advice, you know, because at that point, it's like compared to all the other people who are writing for him, it's like, shit, why the hell should I write for him? I had nothing. There's no good reason. So I think it was almost man, eight or 10 years later. It was eight, eight or nine years later. I sent him a letter and said, hey, you may not remember this conversation, but here's what happens. And here's what I've done in the meantime. You know, I'm finishing my, just started a PhD program in, you know, exercise phys. Here's an article I already wrote for you. If you like it, great. If you don't, that's totally fine. I was actually on metabolic flexibility and he looked at it and he goes, yep, looks good. We'll run it. <laughs> so I think just be yourself, ask people crazy questions and it'll be okay. But I'd be interested in your advice too. For sure. I mean, uh, just to kind of give you some backstory because it's kind of cool how things like unrolled for me is like my very first uh, gym job, I was working with uh, Dean Guido and Anthony Harder. And so oh, they okay. kind of, they, they showed me the ropes. Um, that gym did eventually close. Um, the one and, in Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like okay. Dean and I are both in the Edmonton area today. Um, and then, so just after that gym closed, I ended up being self-employed, but the things that stood out to me about Dean specifically was just the fact that like, I was a, a new trainer and him and I had connected over Instagram and like, I was a spin instructor at the time. And so he would kind of comment on my posts. This was back when he was making more infographics and we would just kind of like <laughs> shoot the shit and have a banter or whatever. And then when he basically, he understood how bad I wanted to be in the industry and he understood that I was willing to put in the work to learn. And it kind of correlates with his willingness, like that year where he just like went all in on continuing education and conferences and yeah. stuff. Like I was at the gym with him, so he would be not at the gym, but like he was out learning like as much as he could. And then I would see him come back and he's just like, like it was hard to even fathom how much information must have been in his head but it was just like finding people who are just like as crazy i think is a good good start oh, totally. <laughs> like and then also just for me it's like values like if i see a person just really genuinely cares then i i gravitate towards that person and i mean everything that happened throughout the year 2020 like that really showed me a lot of the people who are built like me um and then i just I was able to make so many friends through the internet this past year, um, just by being myself. And then I found, found my people in that way. And then it's just, I, I tend to be a very loyal person. So like, um, Dean had a big part in why I got the opportunity to work at that gym. And then him and Anthony both taught me quite a bit. And so I reflect on that even years later, cause I'm like, if not for the actions that they took, I I would have not had those opportunities. And just basically from that moment forward, Dean would just basically tell me who to follow and I would follow them. Oh, and like cool. <laughs> every, everybody that uh, he's interviewed, like I've listened to every podcast that he's ever put out. So like I'll tag you and the ones that you're on, but I'm also listening to every single other thing. And then even when he's been doing shows with Jeb, I listen to those. And then I listen to the ones that uh, Jeb puts out. So it's just like, I, I am similar to you with your like published research, 
but I'm just with the podcast. I'm just like, yeah, I want to hear people talk. And it just, it helps me understand people on a much more deeper level because there's very few people that go through the volume of conversations that I do. Even if I'm not involved in the conversation, I like, like to prepare for this, I listen to like 10 hours of you talking to people so that I oh, could kind of like you. understand you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's basically how I do it. It's, it's, uh, I, I tend to put myself in rooms full of people that are smarter than me who have skills. And if somebody else doesn't see those skills or, or qualities, I tend to be the first person to spot them. Like you kind of, you know, that first impression thing, like I definitely have made the wrong um, first impression or guessed somebody's like personality wrong. But at the same time, I've found with practice, like having talked to like hundreds of people on my own show um, and then hearing conversations of others, I'm able to kind of like pick out the potential in the people in the room and then basically is going to have the bias, like my bias as to what I would be seeking out, but I'm more likely to find it because of the experience in like seeking this stuff out. And then it's just like not putting ourselves in a box, like not just like sitting at the table of people that look kind of like the same, but like mm -hmm. sitting at a table of just complete strangers and seeing how it changes your life sort of thing. And I know my, my experience at the Kansas Fitney fitness summit, um, I, I didn't say a word to hardly anybody. I just kind of sat there and took <laughs> it in and I was just like, I'm just, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to make any bad impressions. So I'm just, just going to shut up, take it in and be here and listen to the conversation. And I thought that was, it was just such a cool experience for me because I basically, uh, it was everything that I could do to be able to afford to go there. And so sure. I was just like stressed the whole time but i was like this is going to work i'm all in on this like this is this is going to pay off and like i'm glad that i was right like when you talked about like burn all the the ships burn the boats um that that's been my career <laughs> like there there are no boats we're only moving forward we don't know how we're going to do it but that's that's just that's how it is so that's like that would be the best way that i can say is how i make friends i basically like i i find like a really rock solid friend like Dean. And then he kind of, he, he's my, my compass as to some of the direction. And then I just kind of find the next friend and then they kind of help. And then I just put myself in a bunch of different rooms, however I can. And lately 2020, it's been digital rooms. It's been interviewing a person asking who they'd want me to interview or who I, th who they think would be a good guest and figuring it out myself kind of thing. But, uh, I highly recommend doing that for anybody that uh, might be shy or reluctant to like see themselves in the same conversation as someone that uh, that might have a lot more experience, but can still have a conversation with them kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, that's the main reason I because I didn't want to do a podcast for a while. I've been on Iron Radio for a bunch of years and been guests on podcasts, but I didn't start my own podcast till like a year ago. And the same thing, the re I realized that like, oh, I, I don't care about metrics. Like, yeah, I want more people to listen to it. I want it to grow, but it's not, it's not my main gig. You know, I don't have to make money off it per se, but it's just another opportunity that I can sit down with, you know, research buddies and be like, Hey, all right. So what about this or that? And, and I know, and I feel better dedicating time to it, knowing that other people will then get something out of it at the same time, you know? So that gives me a little bit more of a, a drive to schedule it and to make it more of a formal thing, knowing that, yeah, it's kind of a selfish thing, but also knowing that it, it's going to help other people and more people will be able to listen to it too. Definitely. And it's like, it's an endless resource, which people like, basically I highly recommend people check out your website because it branches oh, off to you. so many different things. Um, if they, where is your best way for people to find out about you? Is it just going to your website? Is it your social media? What do you usually tell people? Yeah, so the best way is actually through the newsletter. So most, probably 90% of the content I do is through the newsletter. Uh, if you just go to MikeTNelson.com, there'll be ways uh, you can get on the newsletter there. We'll see little free offers. And then I have been trying to put more stuff on Instagram lately. We've been playing around with that a little bit more. So you can find me on Instagram at uh, Dr. Mike T. Nelson. This is D-R-M-I-K-E-T-N-E-L-S-O-N. Yeah, I post stuff on Facebook once in a while. I'm still in this little experiment where eh, Facebook or Instagram, I don't know which one is 
better per se. We're doing a little bit more stuff on Instagram, but uh, most of the stuff I do is through the newsletter. I, like I said, 90% of the content is through there. And it's free to get on there. And then they can just hit reply once they're on the newsletter and say, you listen to me on the podcast here and we'll send them a free gift too. That's awesome. Um, I want to keep us on track for time. So there's yeah. one thing that I ask all of the guests and I get them to give the audience a challenge for the day, something unique to you that you think would uh, make their day or their week a bit better. Hmm. Some requests that I should have other people do. Is that right? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. I would say do something hard today that you haven't done in a while. So that could be a different form of exercise, doing a 2K on the rower. It could be meditation. It could be calling a friend you haven't talked to in a while. But I'd say do something that that you feel for whatever reason is difficult that you haven't done in a while and then do that thing. That's awesome. And with that being said, um, thank you so much for joining me. That uh, wraps up the episode. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate all the really good questions. You did a really good job with that, which is... Uh, that was kind of nice. Uh, little...